Um, this second lecture will be only about the last model, H3, because if there's only one thing you remember from the first lecture, it has to be this, it should be this. That if you care about three manifolds, you, all you should really care about is, is hyperbolic three space. Also, one of you was cre clearly paying attention because they noticed that I wrote eight here instead of infinity, as I should have. Um, okay, just, <coughs> I didn't really talk about, I, I do not plan to say uh, anything about the proof of the geometrization theorem that I stated in the previous lecture. But the way Perelman proved it following an approach of uh, Hamilton, an idea of Hamilton was, okay, we are obviously not smart enough to find, write down the uh, homogeneous metric on a manifold, but how about letting nature find it? We put some smooth metric on the, on the manifold and then le let a, a PDE spread out the curvature and make it as nice and homogeneous as possible. So it turns out there's a, a natural quantity, the Ricci curvature, that you can add to the curvature with a negative coefficient and, <coughs> and then it, uh, it will spread out the, the, the irregularities of the metric. This process might blow up but it will in fact exactly blow up, it will find the interesting subsurfaces, the, the tori and the singular spheres, where the, where the uh, manifold needs to be cut. So nature, nature knows, or PDEs know about the, the decomposition into elementary pieces. Okay, so let's talk about H3. And I'm going to start by drawing a, a few, a little cartoon here of H3. So H3 in the upper half space, model looks something like this. The, the plane down here is P1 of C. If I add the point at infinity to it, um, acting on this is uh, the isometry group of H3, which is also PSL2C. That's all supposed to be a, a, a reminders mainly, but here are for example, totally geodesic planes, they looked like hemispheres over the, over the boundary of the model. Here is a geodesic, it looks like a half circle. Um, here's another geodesic, it looks like a vertical line. Here is a um, plane at constant height, it's called a horosphere. And here is another horosphere, it's a sphere tangent to the boundary at, uh, at a point. And if that point is taken out at infinity, the, the horosphere starts to look like the, like the um, on this horizontal plane that I drew. So that's the first cartoon that I <coughs> want you to have in mind. And maybe there's another one that I will be using. It's, here's an ideal tetrahedron in H3, so it's, it's the span, the complex span of four points. There's a deformation space of such things, which is in fact the complex cross ratio of these four points in P1 of C, if you know what a cross ratio is. And if I truncate this by a horosphere, notice that the horosphere is Euclidean. There's a Euclidean metric preserved by the stabilizer of the horosphere. Well, this horosphere intersects the uh, neighborhood of the, um, well, intersects the, the tetrahedron along a, a triangle that's in fact a Euclidean triangle. And the picture, if I send that point to infinity, is just like here, P1 of C, the four points, one of them is at infinity, and um, the, the red slice here now looks like a, a horizontal slice by a plane parallel to the, to the floor. I have, I have a choice of seeing this triangle, it's a Euclidean triangle, either up here in hyperbolic space or maybe at the boundary because I see the same, the same angles here by projecting down. Also a, a cartoon to, to have in mind. 
So I'm going to talk about some phenomena in hyperbolic um, three manifolds and how we can build many and what they look like. So this, the first <coughs> uh, part will be about what's called thick-thin decompositions. And here's a theorem by, uh, it's called the Margulis constant, so I, we can probably attribute it to Margulis. There exists a positive number epsilon such that uh, points in a, uh, I'm going to say, any finite volume hyperbolic uh, three manifold this will al always mean complete hyperbolic so a quotient of H3 by a, a a group of isometries <coughs> in any hyperbolic three manifold um, the, po uh, the points at which um, the injectiv injectivity radius is less than epsilon uh, form a disjoint um, union of uniform neighborhoods of um, two kinds of things, either short geodesics of the quotient or second possibility um, rank two cusps that is to say uh, ideal points of p1c uh, fixed by some parabolic A parabolic is a transformation that acts on some horse here by translation. In, in, uh, if, if I put the horse here in the, with its center at infinity, those are very special transformations of the hyperbolic space. And they can, in fact, arise in, uh, in a, if, I, uh, if I have a non-compact finite volume quotient. Uh, so moreover, this is, I don't really want to make this part of the theorem, but uh, it is very important morally to see um, two as an extreme case or a limit case of one um, picture following. Okay, what's the injectivity radius? It's uh, whenever you're, you're in a manifold, in a quotient, you can ask yourself how big a ball can I embed around that point? Yes? Case one be a neighborhood of a geodesic. Uniform neighborhoods of. And, and when I oh yeah, th these are points at infinity, but there's a reasonable sense in which we can talk about the, their uniform neighborhoods. I have to talk about Boosman functions and the like. And is it a finite, essentially a finite union of such things? So, if the volume is finite uh, here, then yes, it's a finite union. If not, obviously not. 
In fact, there's a version of this theorem where you don't assume finite volume, but you have to say some things about rank one cusps as well. So I'm going for the simpler statement. Uh, is a finite, yes. Um, Right, so I ask myself, how big a ball can I embed around X? And when the bump, ball starts to bump into itself or into a, an image of itself in the universal cover, then that's as big as the injectivity radius is. So the, the, the regions where the injectivity radius are small is small are kind of simple and stay away from each other. And that's the content of the theorem. Uh, the sense in which 2 is a limit case of 1 is the following. Um, if you take a really short, um, okay, first of all, a, a typical uh, G in PSL2C, is conjugate. to uh, z maps to lambda z, where uh, lambda is in, uh, well, lambda is a complex number of modulus larger than one. So if, I guess if the trace of my element is not in the interval minus one, one or something, uh, minus two, two, then, the, then that's what, what it does. It, it acts on, um, H3 by preserving a line, an axis that I can choose to be between zero and infinity. So this vertical line up here. And it translates along the axis and rotates by some amount. And what I see in the boundary at infinity in the plane is, is a similarity of the plane. Right? The, the log of the ratio of this similarity is the, the, length, <coughs> the length of the short geodesic. So um, let's assume that lambda is really, really close to one in modulus that has some reasonable amount of rotation, then what I'm going to see is, so zero is here, here's maybe a point of C, here is G times C, uh, sorry, uh, P, G times P, here's G2 times P, and it goes on and on, it goes around the origin, and after a while it will come back near the positive real axis, but if the, the modulus is really close to one, it will come back maybe here, right? And go on and on and on. And it goes at, around a second time and comes back here and goes on and on and on. So that's what a, a, a typical really short geodesic does. And what I want you to pay attention to is the fact that big powers can bring back the, the point very close to where it was. So that's the sense in which 2 is a limit case of 1. Namely, if I, if I look only at, the, at this region here, I see something that looks very similar to a lattice of translations. It's not quite a lattice of translations because these are really rotations around a point very, very far away, but by a very, very small angle. So in the limit, it becomes translations. Does that make sense? Um, all right, so the key to the proof, I'm not really going to prove um, the, the thick thin decomposition theorem, but you can make the following sketch work. Key idea, um, in a Lie group, so in, let's say in uh, PSL2C, the commutator of two really small elements, uh, small elements, small means close to the identity, is even smaller. It's a general idea, yes? I'm kind of confused. So I thought that in a hyperbolic uh, 
manifold, the cusps uh, were all rank one, meaning that they were quasi symmetric to lines. That's true in a, for a hyperbolic surface, but not for. In fact, there will be an explicit example later on where the cusp is a rank two <coughs> lattice. In fact, if the if the if the volume is if the, the group is z two. Mm. Yes, that, that's what rank. Yeah, that, that, yeah, it's rank in this sense, not not in the sense okay, okay. of uh, of Lie because theory. In my yeah. Mind yeah, sorry. If, so, yeah. If you chop up the cusp, it will be <coughs> isometric to a line. Well, we can talk about that later. Okay. Thanks. So it's rank in the sense of uh, you look at the stabilizer of the cusp, and that's a virtually oh. abelian group, and you talk right. about the rank so of that I'm group. Happy with that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Rank can have some other meanings as well. Um, <coughs> okay, the, um, the commutator of two small elements is even smaller. What does it? Okay, what is a commutator? A commutator is you apply your element a, and yet then you unapply a, but n not quite a. In fact, a conjugate of a. Right? It's a times b a b inverse. A conjugate means the same thing but done elsewhere. So you apply a. Let's say you translate along its axis, and then you unapply something that looks like A, except it's nearby. So if you, if you translate along your axis and then change the axis a little bit and translate back, that kind of gives you a sense of why the, what you get is, is really close to the identity, identity, even closer than A already was. So um, in particular, uh, if it's even smaller, uh, it has to be trivial. If, for instance, uh, we start with the two smallest elements, a, b, uh, and we assume a, b is discrete. Right? The, this this uh, low injectivity radius business is something about elements that, that act by things close to the identity, and in fact they, they cannot have big... Uh, they have to commute, basically. So I'm not being going to be more rigorous about this, but maybe jack it up in, into a more general statement. In general, in general, um, discrete subgroups of a Lie group generated by small elements must be um, uh, nilpotent as abstract groups. Here abelian because we are in a very special D group. So you can sort of what I described for small elements, you can sort of use it to start an induction and show that the, uh, if, uh, if small elements generate a discrete group, then that group has to be nilpotent. This is an exercise of if the... If Even better, so you know it already. Right? Now, um, this uh, description will be used in what's called hyperbolic Dane filling. So question for you, uh, how can we build many um, compact hyperbolic three manifolds with such short curves, manifolds. Um, so here's, here's a strategy. It will really be an example, but in fact a, an, an infinite class of examples. So I guess we, it's an example that you call, can already call a, a theorem. Um, do the following start with a cusped uh, hyperbolic 3-manifold
For example, I'm going to use this very standard design example, S3, the space minus, here's the figure 8 knot, and for some reason I like to draw it thickened, so, so you can see it's a torus. We remove a solid torus from S3. Knotted solid torus. We call this M. And I claim that this is homeomorphic to the gluing of the two following things. Um, so this is an ideal tetrahedron like the one I, I drew at the top right here, except I have truncated its vertices. and truncation faces. And I glue this, you this uh, hyperbolic truncated ideal tetrahedron to another one. And the map should respect the following um, orange so it should always send a an edge not a truncation face mind you not, not the small ones but the big ones should be identified one of the of this tetrahedron to one of the other in such a way that the arrows match and if you look into it there will be only one way of doing that This, if you have uh, seen the exercise sheet that's outside, it is not the example in the exercise sheet that's outside. It's a very related one, but the arrows look a little bit different. And I'm not, okay, some people claim that they can see how the, tetrahedra, the two tetrahedra here sit in the complement of the knot uh, and uh, tile it. I cannot. Um, I can tell you where the edges are supposed to go. They go here and there, and because it's such a nice manifold, I don't have to care which it's which or which direction it goes. Right, so the, these uh, edges get identified, the faces get identified. For example, here's a face A, or the, the, the face with the dot here, is a face that has two simple arrows going out uh, from, a, from a truncation vertex. And the only one here that matches is, is over here. And if you look at which way the third arrow goes, then we are very fortunate because the, 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 the identification will in fact um, uh, work. Right? I have to turn it over as I glue. And if I do it for the six, for, for the four pairs of faces, then, then the, the gluing is that. So <coughs> there's a way, th there's a what we, we call the cusp tiling, the resulting cusp tiling, is if, if I look at this face A here, it gets glued to the face A prime there, right? The truncation face gets glued, not the face itself, but its boundary, because the adjacent dotted face gets glued. So there's really a... a way in which the truncation faces um, will tile some sort of uh, plane here. If I want to be very 
accurate, I have to put the A prime upside down, I think. Right? Because I have to rotate the right tetrahedron to map it over. So this defines a cusp tiling. And oh, I haven't really, really convinced you yet that, the, that this complement here is a hyperbolic manifold. But in fact, uh, a complete H3 structure uh, results when both tetrahedra are um, regular, so ideal regular. Ideal means it's po their points are at infinity and regular means they have the uh, full all the 24 symmetry group. Uh, that should be clear because the, um, the regular ideal tetrahedron tiles H3 just by reflection in its faces. And what I'm defining here is um, commensurable with, with, this, uh, with this full reflection group of the regular ideal tetrahedron. Right? I, I keep... Uh, it's a subgroup of the finite covolume group that stabilizes the tiling by regular ideal tetrahedra in H3. Okay, so we start with such a manifold. It's not compact, and I've said we, we wanted to, to build compact hyperbolic tree manifold. Um, so we're going to perturb this in a certain sense that I'll try to make concrete and, uh, and uh, usable. So <coughs> I mentioned at one point that, that a An ideal tetrahedron, the shape of an ideal tetrahedron, is the same datum as a Euclidean triangle. Right? Namely, what, what is the Euclidean triangle? It's the shape of this truncation face, of this Euclidean truncation phase. Something I have not said is that all four look the same. If I truncate the face, the, the vertices of an ideal tetrahedron, then I get four Euclidean triangles for the price of one, but they in fact look all the same. Uh, that's one of the symmetries of the cross-ratio uh, property. So let's do the following. Whenever I have a Euclidean triangle, I'm going to write a small label in this corner in each of its corners, namely, if I can take its vertices to 0, 1, and the complex number z by a similarity, then I write z here. And if you work it out, you're going to find that here I have to work. So what is z? It's the second segment, z minus 0, over the first segment, 1 minus 0. So here I have to write uh, 0 minus 1 over z minus 1, or 1 over 1 minus z. And here I have to write, again, if you work it out, 1 minus 1 over z. You can write these little labels. Um, then what we do is write all labels in the cusp tiling into the cusp tiling. So the cusp tiling, I, you, you could check this, uh, we're not going to do it now, but there's a, there's a similar exercise in the sheet. You could check that the cusp tiling really does look like this, like, like a tiling by regular ideal triangles, meeting six at each vertex. And I'm going to, to just write down what the resulting um, labeled 
tiling looks like. So here are the labels, maybe in, in red. Um, a So A and B are the, are the numbers that go here, one for each of the two tetrahedra. I'm going to adjust their shapes. So the shapes are as follows, A, B, A, uh, B, I guess, and then it's the same, B, A, B, goes A, So this is, in fact, a fundamental domain of the tiling that we get, namely the, the four corners here are identified. Sorry, these four get identified. And you can get that in this fundamental domain, I see exactly four A triangles and four B triangles. That's normal because there are four truncation faces of the A tetrahedron and four truncation faces of the B tetrahedron. So that's the shape, and again, to put this into context, above, the, above each of these Euclidean triangles lives an ideal tetrahedron, right? I'm drawing only two of these, but they, they, they live everywhere. So, once we've done this, and we could do it as soon as we find tetrahedra that sort of fit together to, to uh, decompose another manifold, if we had another good example. Uh, I can see a constraint that weighs on the numbers a and b. Namely, si since this is the same vertex as that by, by translation, by, by periodicity, um, I can see that multiplying all the, all the numbers in the, all the labels in those corners should give me one. In fact, it should, it's even more precise than that. The, the, the complex arguments that, I, that they have should add up to exactly 2 pi. Right? That's called the gluing condition. And there's one gluing condition for each vertex. Um, so here is Z2 periodicity the gluing condition or constraint says um, let's see I start with the bottom with the bottom four one minus one over B times A, times 1 minus 1 over B again, times 1 minus 1 over A, and then I see B and 1 minus 1 over A again, squared, should be equal to 1 in complex variables. Uh, so let's rewrite this to, I guess, uh, a minus 2 plus a inverse, b minus 2 plus b inverse plus 1. 
Uh, so I have two complex numbers, a, b, a equals b equals e to the, so the sixth root of unity, i pi over 3, is clearly a solution. Right? Because this then becomes minus 1 times minus 1. Um, this is still one, uh, only one condition for one uh, vertex. In fact, if I look at all the other vertices, I'm going to always write down the same, uh, the same condition. In fact, that's, it's, it's already expected that I should find the same condition at least one second time, because this edge, um, I mean, this point here is the end point of some edge, uh, com uh, some blue edge coming from infinity, and there's the opposite end point of that blue edge that has a representative somewhere in the tiling, so it's, I should see each equation twice. But there's, in fact, one more redundancy in this case. So, um, other vertices... Uh, yield the same constraint. There's in fact a very nice linear algebra that you can do to show to to predict the number of independent constraints in terms of the number of tetrahedra and the number of cusps. In this case, there's two tetrahedra, one cusp, and the formula says there should be exactly one constraint on the two variables. Um, what about nearby solutions to the gluing equation? Nearby in the sense of close to the one uh, given by the, the ideal uh, Given the uh, the hyperbolic metric, so if they are nearby, that means the um, locally triangles will still glue up, right? I, I will still be able to travel around an edge and, and find a nice developing map that's uh, that's defined at every uh, vertex. But this Z two periodicity has no longer any reason of being by translations. This was another miracle of, of e to the i pi over 3, that I get horizontal periodicity by a translation and vertical by another translation. So in general, um, a prime, b prime will define a solution, a nearby solution, a prime, b prime, will define a um, developing map invariant under some, uh, well, equivariant under some abelian subgroup of uh, the similarities, so uh, R, I guess, uh, C star semi-direct C, the similarities of the complex plane, the, the stabilizer of the point at infinity. Um, usually, usually valued in uh, C minus some point omega. What this looks like is here is maybe my starting triangle, my, my starting uh, yeah, triangle, A. And we know there's a vertical, it's glued to another copy of itself above, or yeah, A here. Um, it's glued to a copy of itself above. That's not necessarily quite a translation of A. It's, it's slightly rotated, slightly scaled. And there's another one, and another one, and who knows. And uh, as I keep developing, I'm going to use A for the 
I mean white for the copies of the, the A tile, but uh, this extends and eventually I see another white triangle. And then another one, they get bigger and bigger as we, the, the copies of, the, of A that we see get bigger to the right in this case and smaller to the left. And there's a center omega here. Right? The, the, the uh, lattice of translations has become a slightly different commutative group of similarities of the plane that uh, preserves this tiling. It's not really a tiling because it wraps around. So they, the, if I travel far enough uh, upwards here, I will eventually find triangles that superimpose with other triangles in the picture and so on. So um, that's the uh, that's what it looks like, and I guess if I name I could name this one zero zero. This is a one zero. This is a two zero, and this would be choose one doesn't matter which a zero one a one one a two one, and here comes a. Uh, Zero, two, and so on. Right? I can I can coordinateize this, this by just, you know, using z two coordinates from over here and wrapping them around. Now um, the key insight, and that's a, that's something, again, Thurston realized, is that since. Um, a, B, the, this value we started with, is a generic uh, point of the solution space to the, the Bluing equation. As we perturb a little bit, we can basically, there, there will be locally a unique way of ensuring that the PQ copy gets superimposed exactly on the 0, 0 copy. Excuse me? Yes. So, which one is called then filling? I'm getting there. So this is a this is a transversality statement. By transversality, since uh, A0, B0 is a smooth solution, is a smooth point. Uh, yeah. Of the defining equation. Uh, for large PQ, PQ, there will be a unique uh, APQ, BPQ near N0, B0, such that Um, A00, zero, zero, the tile, the, the original tile coincides uh, with APQ. So you have to imagine that this, this nice sunflower really closes up in, a, in, a, uh, in an exact way after turning around once and the, <coughs> and the um, tile that coincides with zero zero is not just any tile, but, but for large, I'm going to say co prime PQ, a co prime pair, an irreducible vector of the lattice um, will coincide. So 
uh, then we can truncate off uh, how did I phrase this we can truncate off a um, all tetrahedra by a uniform neighborhood of the line omega infinity right and because everything is symmetric around the point omega the, this what does a uniform neighborhood of this line uh, omega infinity look like it looks like a cone right? a cone opening up at a constant angle from the <coughs> from uh, the line omega infinity and so uh, since a cone looks everywhere the, the same basically this will truncate all tetrahedra in the same way it doesn't matter which tetrahedra in the orbit you are looking at. Right above, above each of these triangles lives, a, lives an ideal tetrahedron, basically in the, in the room, and you're all truncating them in the same way because a, co a cone is a cone. Um, so uh, this truncation is equivariant. And glue back in Omega is the point omega. It lives in uh, in C, but more more, more uh, generally in P one of C. In C union infinity. So there's this line connecting omega to the point at infinity, and the okay. this, the group of similarities uh, of C that preserves the tiling also preserves in H two in H three the, the line omega infinity. If some some group of rotations, translations are around that line. Sorry, the developing map is that supposed, is that kind of like developing the cost? Yes, yeah, so it's a developing map of this combinatorial picture. You forget you forget it had angles and everything. You just keep the, the torus, and <coughs> you affect new shapes to them, and that's called a developing map. It maps to the to to C to the plane C. It's a complex structure. Um, so we do this truncation and glue back in notice that the that these tetrahedra some <coughs> they are redundant because a00 is the same as apq and they <coughs> they decompose everything um, in the cone inside the cone except the axis of the cone right? uh, above this point there's nothing not <coughs> sufficiently high <coughs> above any any other point of the plane, there is some tetrahedron that, that uh, uh, covers that region. So we glue back in a uh, solid torus um, in the quotient whose core curve is given by, so is, is generated by whatever is left. Basically we've killed PQ, we've p killed the PQ translation in the, in the stabilizer of the cusp. Uh, so what's left is a similarity taking A00 to A P prime Q prime where uh, p prime q prime is a complement p prime q prime z or, sorry z times p prime q prime plus z times p q is z2 right so uh, that in order to have all of z2 the that's this z2 over here in order to get all of z2 as a, as a as a direct sum like this, I had to assume PQ was uh, primitive. Uh, and then it has a complement, and we can really see the, the solid, uh, the, this solid torus is a quotient of the cone that I described, the uniform neighborhood of this, uh, this axis. 
by the rotation translation of uh, parameter p prime q prime. So that's a it's basically very short, but has an angle that I have little control over. It depends. I mean, wh when you have when you have a, a the point PQ in your lattice Z squared, then its complement P prime Q prime is basically almost the same direction, but it, it might look shorter, uh, much shorter, a little bit shorter. You, you, don't, you have little control over its size. Um, so this, uh, this becomes a, a statement about the, the, the close directions mean the, the, the length of this similarity is very short, but uncontrolled uh, size means the angular angular component is very um, well. It is not uh, not a priori small. So topologically, what have we done? Topologically, we have um, taken the uh, complement of this torus. This, this knotted solid torus and glued back in a solid torus that killed a slow PQ on the on the boundary of the knotted solid torus, and that's what the infilling is called. Oh, that's what sorry, so is called the infilling. Right in the in the in this solid torus that that had the, I'm only drawing part of it, but that was tiled by Euclidean triangles. Um, we have attached topology. to the boundary of the compactification of M, so sorry, torus, oh, sorry, the torus. Uh, killing the slope PQ. Um, If you want a cartoon, here is M. It has some topology. It has this cusp that was really a torus times R, and we have attached a solid torus to it with a map that, that kills some slope, but that makes it compact. The result is a Compact hyperbolic three manifold called the Dane filling. Of M. So, theorem by Thurston, but I have basically proved it in this example. Um, uh, Thurston say, says, if um, M is a cusped, uh, let's say a one cusp for simplicity, one cusped hyperbolic three manifold, and then all All but finitely many um, Dane fillings are still hyperbolic, are also hyperbolic, with nearly isometric, um, nearly isometric thick part.
if, um, if PQ is large. So PQ are the parameters of the Dane feeling. Um, and nearly isometric comes from the fact that, that for large PQ, the, the perturbation AB had to be only very small. Also, also the volume decreases under such feelings. So vol of M PQ, it may be a little bit counterintuitive because it might feel like we're adding something, we're adding a solid torus, but in fact the volume goes down. Quickly. Um, so this can be proved uh, using something called Schleifli's formula. That uh, I mean, there's an exer exercise about the formula in the in the sheet. Um, now this might look like a one little trick to generate some. Uh, compact hyperbolic 3-manifold, but it's in fact a very ubiquitous phenomenon. So th that's the content of the last theorem I want to mention. So a theorem that's uh, almost an observation really, by Thurston and Jorgensen. <coughs> Under a given volume, There exist only finitely many topological types of thick parts of hyperbolic uh, three manifolds. So that's that. Uh, it might look either deep or trivial, depending how you think about it, but you're looking at the thick part, so you can cover it by epsilon balls for some uniform epsilon. And these balls will overlap in a bounded way, so you can bound the number of balls that you will need and the, the possible combinatorial pattern of their intersections. So there's a huge, 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 but finite number of things that can happen, basically. So you can make this rigorous, but it's, it's, there's a really not, nothing more to it. And in fact, everything beyond these uh, thick parts is the infilling. You, you take the thick part and then you do some, something like this um, in, in, the, in the, the tori. So corollary um, the set of volumes of hyperbolic three manifolds Has, um, is well ordered because basically everything is a Dane filling on one uh, of finitely many uh, thick parts under a given volume and Dane filling always takes the volume down. It's well ordered and in fact we know the type. Uh, no, I do mean to include the cast ones. So the cast ones will be the accumulation points of this, uh, of the, I mean the volumes of the, the volumes of the <coughs> cast ones. Uh, and the type is omega to the omega, so that means there's basically one hyperbolic manifold of smallest volume, it's in fact known nowadays which one it is. There's one, then there's a next one, smallest possible vol volume, and a next one, and a next one, and the first accumulation point, that's the smallest volume of the smallest one cast manifold. And if you look a little bit further, there will be a second accumulation point and a third accumulation point and so on. And then the first accumulation point of accumulation points, that's omega squared. That's the first, that's the smallest two cusped uh, manifold. It goes on and on and on and you add accumulation points of accumulation points of accumulation points. You, you add one word to that sentence each time you add one cusp. It goes up to this, uh, this ordinal here. Thank you, I'm over time.